Hi, this is Dr. Audrey Drummonds with Interior Coverings Ministry. Uh, thank you for joining me. I've got something really heavy on my heart that um, I want to share some nuggets that uh, the church is really having a hard time sharing and discussing, and it comes out of the book of Revelation, uh, the end of the, the Bible that John talked about that we've made speculations on what was John really talking about. Uh, if you've ever read any of my other books, I've been working on the, uh, the book of Revelation for quite a while. The Lord had me start um, uh, several years ago that I wrote this one book. You can get it on Amazon. And basically, it's uh, chapters 1 through 7. And what happened was it came through the, the season where we were um, seeing a lot of the Left Behind series and what's going to happen at end times. And so people were speculating, and, and I call it cherry-picking scriptures out of Revelation that validated in their thoughts of, of a doom and gloom, a heaven and hell, a rapture, uh, all sorts of theological discussions. But uh, something never hit right with me. So I went back through that book, and I compared it with... John's other writings, the Gospel of John, as well as the three letters that he wrote, to find out how does one have the same mindset writing uh, Revelation, the Gospel of John, and, and his three letters, all in, in the same era, around 90 to 95 AD, and yet from one book we have so much love coming through, and then the other one coming through as if God's going to get you, and, and a wrath, and a condemnation. So it wasn't hitting right for me. So I went back through Revelation and I did verse by verse to allow the scriptures to inter interpret themselves versus the time and the season that theologians were, were trying to pull through as far as what CNN would have on their news or um, what one co uh, country or culture was dealing with versus another. That God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if you're interested in, in seeing God as love, God as light, and God as life, and that there is really no darkness, um, pick up this book uh, and start reading Revelation with a whole fresh understanding because, as John wrote in the very beginning, that if you read it with the right heart, you will be blessed. Because the basicness is the book of Revelation is about Christ in you being developed and being transformed into his image as first john 4 17 says that as he is so are we today in this world um if you like that one then i wrote this one a little bit later uh, and it'll take you through uh chapters 8 through 13 which is interesting because um most people whether they know too many scriptures or not there's this um anxiety or or phobia over if they see 666, if they see it on a license plate, if they see it, um, you know, on, on a game show or something, it's like a, a superstition of the number 13. Well, the same thing with 666. And they pulled that from, from Revelation uh, chapter 13. And I try to explain what that 666, 666 really is. But I say all of that as an introduction to what I'd like to talk about today because I'm, I'm going back through and I'm picking up chapter 14 in Revelation and again, unveiling the Christ in you. So as I started, I had to revisit chapter 13 to recall what was all of that about, about refreshing my, my memory. But what I'm finding out is God has a timetable, and in his timetable, um, we have three main feasts that we call Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Um, a lot of the church doesn't even have a clue of what you're talking about. Your Messianic churches do, Pentecostal churches uh, probably do, uh, but it, it comes from our, our, our roots of Old Testament that Jesus used in fulfilling the New Testament and all of the teachings, all of the teachings of Paul and John and Peter all have a connection of a root system with 
uh, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. With Passover, you know, it's it's the cross. And how you want to view that, how you want to, you know, deal with that, with the resurrection, you have to understand the intensity of, of the Passover in order to move into Pentecost. And Pentecost is 50 days later. And with Pentecost, that's when the church was built. So with Passover, it's an individual thing, but the church as a corporate was Pentecost. But then again, we have to narrow down the churches. The church is only one body. It's not a bunch of denominations. It's not being pa uh, Pentecostal or Catholic or Baptist or Methodist. It is one body with one father um, through Jesus Christ as the head of that body. That Pentecost then moves into what we refer to as tabernacles in the fall, and it's the in gathering. Now, all of these three feasts, oftentimes we can't get past that as far as what's God's timetable doing? What is the end times really looking like? Well, let's go back to Passover. Passover is the blood covenant. And if we start looking at God's covenants, we have a blood covenant, which is, is Jesus died once and he died for all. But then Pentecost is the name covenant. Because at Pentecost is when, when basically um, God married his church. God married his people. And he gave them his name. And with the name comes the nature. So when you refer to yourself as being a Christian, you should be referring to it not because you're a sinner saved by, gay, uh, uh, by grace, excuse me, or by... Um, uh, because you said a sinner's prayer or because you believe in Jesus. No, when you get to Pentecost, you're married. And when you are married, you are taking the name and the nature and the understanding of your beloved. That's what Pentecost is all about. And with Pentecost, that's the reason why the disciples were able to then go out from Jerusalem and start doing greater works that Jesus was doing. They were raising the dead. They were healing the sick. That's the that's what the church is supposed to be doing now if we refer to ourselves as Christians. Not waiting for him to come back to swoop us out of here, but to take on that name and that nature because we already see ourselves as married to the Lamb. From there, when we go into tabernacles, and this is a key, Tabernacles is the threshold covenant. It is the end gathering. You have the name if you are a Christ one. You already have the nature. You already have the ability preparing yourself as the bride. You haven't consummated the marriage. And consummating the marriage is the threshold. That's when the groom picks her up and carries her over the door, the door post coming, coming across. So when we say he's knocking at the door, that's not about a Passover. That's not a sinner saved by grace. That he's knocking on your heart saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm giving you everything I have. You are one with me. And, and in doing so, allowing a heart change within ourselves. See, it takes a while. For, for a bride, that when she gets married, she doesn't instantly start uh, recognizing that she has a new name, a new nature. And oftentimes after the honeymoon of the wedding and everything is over, she starts like, wait, wait a second. You mean I have to wash your clothes? I'm washing my own. You mean I need to cook for you when I want to eat this food? And, and oftentimes she starts finding, oh, well, the honeymoon's wearing off. What's going on? That's that four months in the wilderness. So you had the marriage at Pentecost, but now you have four months in the wilderness where those 10 virgins are starting to fall asleep. It's like, huh, things are just not quite the way I thought it was. I'm, can I go back home to mom and dad? At least I knew me, the me, me, me in me. No, you need to get, get into the understanding of the consummating of the marriage. And that's more than just the intimacy of, of sleeping. It was where the bride 
is no longer about the me, me, me of being a bride, but she desires to consummate and carry the child. That's the threshold. She takes on the name, she takes on the nature, and she takes on the identity of her husband as a wife. And when that happens, which is the tabernacles, and most of the church is waiting for it to happen. That's the reason why we use the word rapture. We want to be raptured out of here. No, we want to be raptured here, here, here in our heart. So that when we get to that rapture stage of intimacy with the oneness, not out there, not blaming them, but allowing the trials and the tribulations that you're going through to transform you into his image. So that when he impregnates you with the word, it becomes salt and light. That you are the salt of the earth. He's trying to say something here. And it's not just a pretty metaphor. You are the salt of the earth. But, and when the word, the water of the word, mixes with that salt, the purity, and the salt ions start to separate in the separation and then in the oneness with the water, you can light up a light bulb. Did you know that? That's just basic science. We like to hear what basic science is. That's a, an elementary level of a science project of just taking salt water and having just the right, right um, uh, uh, parts to it of the wires and the intimacy with it, and you have a light bulb, and you can light a light bulb. That's what happens with the intimacy of us. And it's called a salt covenant. And in that salt covenant, it's only mentioned twice in the Bible, in, in the book of Numbers and in uh, uh, Chronicles, where it was referring to the priest anointing and the kingship anointing. That God comes in, out of Isaiah, and he refers to it in Isaiah 59, where he's having an intimacy with you. He is placing his name, his nature, his identity in you. I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. Of, of, um, where I had it. But as he's placing it in you, then in Isaiah 60, you're coming out of the bridal chamber. And it says, arise and shine, for your light has come. That light is the Christ in you now projecting outward that you are the salt of the earth. Let your light, let your Christ in you radiate forth. But if your salt isn't, isn't in the purity form, isn't in the healing form, isn't in the, the, the worthiness form, did you know that back in, in Jesus' day that salt was used for money and a day's wage of salt was your worth? That was the illustration he was trying to give so that you can do a comparison of understanding. Let your light in your life shine before others. Judge not, lest you be judged yourself. But consider all as one body in Christ. And the way you do that is with the unconditional love that God gave to you while you were in darkness, while you were in sin. And when you have that oneness, you can't do it on your own. But you know that you've been redeemed by the blood covenant. You've got the name, the nature, and the identity of knowing who you are in Christ and Christ in you. And then, which is, is the Pentecostal moment, then you have the threshold caring. That he carries you. That it's no longer what you have to do because it's Christ in you that is now moving and having his being in you in order that carries you across the threshold into the bridal chamber to consummate it, to impregnate. You see, the bride can't impregnate. Only the husband can. And Jesus Christ now becomes the lover of your soul. The husband of who your soul has longed for into oneness so that when the word is impregnated into you, it's got a, a nine month uh, of transformation. 
that you be cautious of your words, you be cautious of your movements because you don't want to injure the word. You don't want to abort the baby. And in the right timing and in the season that he has you in, out of your mouth will flow rivers of living water. Not as a double-mindedness of life and death, but in a oneness that says, let there be light. So the salt water becomes the light of the world. That's the stage we're in. That's the season that we're in. As we're going into um, the, the Passover season and then counting the Elmer, keep in mind that Jesus died once and for all on the cross. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the Christ in you. He did not appear as the man from Galilee or, the, or Jesus of Nazareth to the disciples after the resurrection. Those 40 days of ascension, he was showing them day by day the unveiling of who they are because of what he did and that the enemy has no authority anymore. I've got more on this topic. Look forward to talking to you again. God bless you. And I pray that you will... Uh, check us out on, on my website at www.icministries.org. And I'll uh, see you again. Bye.